Okay, so we've been looking at the story, um, the tabernacle of David, but we've been looking at the history of the, the things that David saw, the things that David heard, the things that David experienced that really gave him the vision and the inspiration to set up the tabernacle of David, which was 24-7 praise and worship, prayer and prophetic. For 33 years, the goal of David was to usher in to the kingdom of Israel the presence of God. And so for 33 years, non-stop praise and worship, declaration of scripture, uh, intercession for the nation, and, and the prophetic declarations were coming forth for 33 years. And, and because of that, the kingdom of David became the greatest kingdom in, in the history of Israel because the power of God was behind the kingdom. Mm. And, and uh, God's presence was empowering the, the kingdom of David and, and they were victorious over their enemies and they took territories that past generations have lost. They took back territories yeah. and they even took new ground. Yeah. And uh, I want you to know this, that the goal of David was to bring in the fullness of the presence of God and the tabernacle of David lasted 33 years and Jesus Christ walked the earth for 33 yeah, years. Yeah. Uh, so there's a number of parallels that go on with this. Um, but uh, obviously David's inspiration, David's vision, and a lot of things came from the prophet Samuel who was his spiritual father, mm -hmm. his mentor. And uh, the anointing that, that God had given Samuel... Samuel passes on an anointing to David, and then David, with that anointing, builds the tabernacle of David, the house of bread. And uh, what I want to look at today, I want to look at the, the company of prophets. Mm. Samuel's company of prophets. Um, and we've been looking at the story of Samuel, who was a, a priest. He was a Nazarite priest and a prophet, and he was a judge of Israel. He held all of those different anointings, prophet, priest, and kingly anointing. He was a Nazarite, consecrated under God. Um, but you know, he multiplied himself. Samuel didn't stay a lonely prophet. He multiplied himself and he established a company of Nazarites and prophets. And uh, talks about that company of Nazarites and prophets in uh, the first book of Samuel. Um, when we hear about the companies of prophets in Scripture, we also hear about the companies of prophets in the days of Elijah and Elisha. And they also established these companies. And the word company in Hebrew literally means the sons of the prophets um, because the prophets like Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, they functioned like spiritual fathers. And those spiritual fathers were raising up spiritual sons. And... Um, also, John the Baptist, he had a company of Nazarite prophets. John the Baptist was also a Nazarite and a prophet. And John the Baptist in his day in the wilderness, he raises up this company of Nazarite prophets to prepare. They are the forerunners preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. Amen. And um, very interesting story about John. You know, John came from the, 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 the lineage of the Kohathites and uh, he was... He was from the lineage that the, the, the priests would be chosen from. And uh, even though the nation of Israel at that time, they chose these two men that would be in rotation as high priest. So there was a religious institution of the priesthood. Mm. And the religious institution where they commissioned and ordained uh, these different people to be priests, they commissioned and ordained these two men to be high priest. And those two men would rotate as high priest, but they were the choice of men. That's it. I believe John the Baptist was God's choice. Amen. I believe that God's high priest um, in, in the days of preparation for Jesus to come was John the Baptist. That's the one God said, you are my high priest. And he was not just a high priest in the Levitical order. Uh, he was moving as a high priest uh, in, in the whole Melchizedek order the Zadok priesthood, which uh, we've been looking a little bit in that concept, that there is a priesthood that is higher and more powerful than the Levitical priesthood. Mm. Um, because around John, it wasn't just 
uh, Levites that were coming and joining his company of prophetic Nazarite prophets. He was bringing into that company people from other tribes. And, uh, and so it's a very powerful thing. Now, we're going to start by looking at 1 Samuel chapter 9. So at 1 Samuel chapter 10. Verse 5 to 7. Now, this is in the days that Israel had no king, but Samuel was functioning as a king. And Israel said, we want a king, like all the other nations. And Samuel was deeply grieved because God was their king. But they say, we want to be just like all the other nations. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and God said to Samuel, let them have a king. Let them have what they want. It's, it, you know, they're rejecting me, not you. And... Um, so the, the, the king, which was really ultimately, God chose him, but God chose him because of the people's choice. It. it wasn't really God's ultimate choice. God's ultimate choice for king would be David, a man after his own heart. That's right. um, but because the people were demanding a king, God gave them what they demanded. And, and God will do that for you. He'll give you what you demand. If you demand enough, he'll give it to you. It will come from God, but it won't be his best. That's it, yeah. And there's a lot of chagrin, a lot of pain and suffering came into Israel uh, because of Saul. So this is really right in the beginning where God was actually giving even Saul an opportunity. God was speaking out prophetically promises over Saul's life. This is who you can be. This is who I am. This is the anointing I'm going to give you. And if you have followed me with all your heart, then this is what's going to happen. So it was, it was prophesied over Saul many good things. Uh, because God was even wanting for him good things. Um, and uh, we, we come down after Saul was anointed to be king. He was, he was anointed with oil. We'll look a little bit more at the story of Saul at a later date. Um, but I want to look at this part of the story, starting with verse 5 of chapter 10. Samuel is speaking to Saul what is about to take place. Uh, after that, you're going to go to Gibeah of God where there is a Philistine outpost. And as you approach the town, you'll meet a procession of prophets and they'll be coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, flutes and harps being played before them and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will then come upon you in power and you will prophesy with them and you will be changed into a different person. But once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Down to verse 9. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all of these signs were fulfilled that day. And when they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God then came upon him in power, and he joined them in their prophesying. And with all of those who had formerly known Saul, saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, and he said, who is their father? Or who is the, the father of the prophets? So it became a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Okay. Just uh, I make a, 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 an observation here, back in verse 1. When Samuel anoints Saul to be king, he, he fills a clay flask with the anointing oil. That's right, yeah. When you would anoint someone to be king, priest, or prophet, you would anoint them by filling up a, a ram's horn. Mm. The ram's horn, whenever it uses in Scripture, uh, the, the Lord is my horn, it literally it means the Lord is my strength, is my power. Okay, The horn was a sign of power and strength. And so they would put the oil, the anointing oil that represents the power of the person of the Holy Spirit, into the ram's horn, which represents the vessel or the person into which the, the power of the Holy Spirit is coming. And so the ram's horn, they were wild goats that were in the wilderness and they were they were mountain goats and they were in the wilderness and they were prepared in the wilderness and they're not like the normal little billy goat that you get milk from you know these are really uh, 
almost like deer or antelope, very, very strong, and they could climb the mountains and, and really high mountains. And it's just amazing, these mountain goats. And um, that they would use the, the, the mountain goat ram's horn as a sign of a person who's been prepared in the wilderness. Um, that they have got an inner strength, that the person themselves has a character that's been developed by the wilderness. And then when the oil of the power of the Holy Spirit comes, they're a vessel that can carry that. That's why David was anointed with the ram's horn. That's it, yeah. However, when Samuel anoints Saul, he gets a clay flask. Because the clay flask, clay is made from the dirt, and dirt always represents the flesh. Mm. Our fleshly, human, carnal, uh, sinful nature. Our, our, our fleshly humanity it comes from the dirt. Our bodies come from the dirt. Um, and, 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 and the thing was, the anointing oil that Samuel poured into the flask and that Samuel poured over Saul's head was the same anointing oil that would go in the ram's horn. Yeah. The Holy Spirit that, that God would anoint every single believer is the same Holy Spirit. That's there right. aren't two Holy Spirits out there. Right, that's right. You're not going to find, oh, are you the other Holy Spirit? No, no, no. It's not like each one of us gets a different Holy Spirit. There's that's one right. Holy Spirit. So Saul gets the same Holy Spirit anointing that David gets. That's it. Saul gets the same Holy Spirit anointing that John the Baptist got, that Samuel got. That's it. They get the same Holy Spirit anointing, if you can receive this, that Jesus Christ, when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, it's the same Holy Spirit. That's it. But the vessel was different. That's right. Yeah, that's it. And this is where the problem starts. That's it. Because here is this man who is not yielded to the Spirit of God. He's not yielded to the will of God. Uh, right. He's all about me. He's all about build my own name, build my own kingdom. Um, I want people to look at me. I want to be famous. Mm. And, and, um, and so he was a man of the flesh. And <clears throat> that's why everyone's really like shocked because they... You know, Saul wasn't a really spiritual guy. He wasn't someone that would seek after God. He wasn't a man with a heart after God's own heart. He was just someone that would just go out and, and work for his father and just do natural things. You know, in the natural world, he might have been faithful for his father, but he wasn't a spiritual man. That's, yeah. He didn't have a heart that was after God's own heart. He didn't hunger God's heart. He was just interested in the things of this world. That's the dirt. The flesh it doesn't necessarily just mean sin. It means the natural. Yeah. He was just interested in the natural arena of things. That's it. And, uh, and so even though it was the same power of the same Holy Spirit, and God did work in him and through him at times, but it was very limited and it was very corrupted. Not that the Holy Spirit is corrupted. It's the Holy Spirit flowing through him. He corrupted the work. Mm. Okay. Now what happens here, Samuel says to Saul, when you leave me, you're going to go to a place called Gibeah. Uh, in Gibeah, there is a Philistine stronghold. The Philistines were the enemies of Israel, and they'd taken that area of Gibeah, and they'd set up their fortress or their stronghold. Um, but the th interesting thing is, where the enemy's stronghold was, there is a company of prophets. Mm. And Samuel said, when you get to Gibeah, where the Philistine stronghold is, you're going to meet this company of prophets. And so here is this picture. There was a mountain in Gibeah, a high place. And this is the stronghold of the enemy. He said, you're going to meet the prophets, and they're going to be coming down from the high place. And as they come down from the high place, they've got instruments. And they're going to be playing their instruments as they come down from the high place. They're going to be singing. They're going to be worshipping. They're going to be praying. They're going to be interceding. And they're going to be prophesying. Mm -hmm. And when you meet them, the Spirit of God that is around their company is going to come upon you. You too will start to prophesy. And so when Saul goes and he meets this company of prophets, 
coming down from the high place, the Spirit of God is all around them. They've literally they've opened up a spiritual gate to heaven, and heaven's atmosphere filled their time of worship and prayer. And they literally they brought heaven to earth. By the way, Jesus says when we pray, that's what we should be praying. If it wasn't possible, he wouldn't ask us to pray it. Amen? Right, yeah. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let your kingdom manifest in the earth as it manifests in heaven. Can you think about that? Let heaven manifest in earth as heaven manifests in heaven. Mm. And Jesus said, you need to pray this way and you need to believe it. Mm. And so this company of prophets would be worshipping. This is their activity. This is the activities that David saw important to bring in the presence of God. This is the activity of the house of prayer. This is what our vision is. I'm sharing our vision. We're, just, we're not a normal church. We are a house of prayer. Amen. Our, we, our passion is to bring heaven to earth. Amen. We want to see a heaven invade earth. Amen. But, but heaven can't invade earth through you until it invades you. That's it. <laughs> You've got to be a house of prayer. Amen. And so their activities is they go up on the mountain to the high place and they would start with worship. And worship is how you tune into God. It's how you tune into heaven. It's how you, you tune out of the flesh realm. Remember, Saul is anointed. This is his problem. Is he was anointed with a clay flask. He's a man of the flesh. Even if the Holy Spirit filled him, the Holy Spirit's power was hindered. Mm. We've got to be like David. Men and women are with hearts after God's own heart. We've got to have a hunger for heaven. We've got to have a hunger to bring heaven to earth. Every time we come to church, every time we jump in the car, every time we go to work, we want to encounter God. Mm. We want to encounter heaven. It's not just about the things of this world. Yeah, that's fair. And so they would start by tuning into God through, through worship and they'd be bringing up their thanksgiving and they'd be bringing up their praises to God in song and prayer and then they'd be bringing their petitions to God and they'd be praying and interceding for the whole nation. Here they are in the high place praying over the situation of the enemy stronghold. They were doing spiritual warfare. They understood the only way we can really defeat the Philistines is not by... The weapons of this world. Mm -hmm. But our weapons are mighty in God's power to demolish strongholds. Mm -hmm. They understood that. One, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. We have weapons that are mighty in God's power to destroy strongholds. It's not the weapons of this world. They were literally doing spiritual warfare against the Philistines and against the, the, the uh, demonic powers behind the Philistines. Mm. And so the thing is that when you have this priestly ministry and you arise on the mountain of God with prayer and with intercession, with praise and with worship, and you come to a place where you start to encounter Him, when you encounter Him on the high place, spiritual gates are open and you start to feel the presence of heaven. You start to get visions. You start to hear the word of the Lord. God becomes real to you. And then this is where prophecy breaks out. For you, yeah. those of you who are in the prophetic ministry uh, team training, next Thursday is our next night for a prophetic ministry team training. We start from next Thursday. We meet here on Thursdays from now on, just to let you know. But listen to this. If you really want to be prophetic, you've got to learn how to pray. You've got to learn how to worship. You've got to learn how to praise. You've got to learn how to tune in. You've got to learn how to climb the mountain of God. Amen. And enter into the presence of God. Amen. And um, so the prophetic comes out of you ministering to God. First commandment, first priority, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and strength. And as you keep loving God, you can't love God unless you know how to praise Him. That's right. Unless you know how to worship Him. Yeah. Unless you know how to talk to Him. And you value talking to Him. Mm. Like you can't wait to pray. Mm. So I can't wait to start praising God today. So awesome. I just love God so much. I can't wait. See, that's David's heart. Saul never had that heart. And so they would, they would enter in and then out of that encounter with God would flow then prophetic declaration. Prophetic warfare. They move into their kingly anointing in the spirit where they'd have spiritual authority to start to come against demonic powers. Now, Saul 
comes into their presence because literally they're bringing the presence of heaven now down into the earth. Saul walks into that atmosphere of heaven that is being created by that worship. This is why we put such an emphasis at Lions Rule, House of Prayer. We want to pray and we want to worship. That's what we we're doing this morning. We we're opening up spiritual gates. Some of you are being touched by that. That's great, but don't be a Saul. Because you know what? Saul moved into the presence of the prophets, and when he was there, he was enjoying the presence of the Lord. And he even started to prophesy, which is really amazing. He even joined them. Everyone's going, wow, what has happened? He's even amongst them. He's prophesying. This is awesome. And he would prophesy. But as soon as Saul left the company of prophets, that whole anointing was gone. Now, he had the Holy Spirit anointing with him for certain things. But to prophesy, to hear God's voice, it didn't follow him. And... Um, <clears throat> Christians are like that, often. If you're a clay flask Christian, That's it, yeah. if you as a vessel are like Saul, okay, maybe when you come to church, you get filled with the presence of the Spirit and you get really excited and you can really press into the worship because everyone else is pressing in. That's it, yeah. Everyone else is rejoicing. And you can, you can join them because there's an atmosphere of heaven that starts to break out here. Mm. But when you leave this place and you go home, then you go back into the kingdom of darkness territory. It's like you, the dark cloud comes back, you know. It's like the dark cloud's waiting for you outside that door and you go straight back under it. <laughs> That's Saul. Because he didn't know how to carry the presence of heaven in himself. David knew how to carry the presence of heaven with him wherever he went. Samuel knew this. Samuel, as a spiritual father, was training the prophets up how to enter into heaven and bring heaven to earth. He was training them how to carry...